Greetings, Creepy Readers. The third episode of the Creepy Reader Podcast begins in three, two, one. Well, hello there, Creepy Readers. It's me, your host, Coffin J. And welcome to the third episode of the Creepy Reader Podcast, the literary horror show made and named just for you. I know it's been a hot minute. I'm so, so sorry. Had some things happen in my personal life. Uh, But fuck all that. (laughs) Today, I'm joined once again by my compadre, Zombie Zach, and for the first time, his lovely cadaverous wife, Creepy Caitlin. Guys, welcome to the Creepy Reader Podcast. How you doing? I'm doing great, Jason. Uh, or I'm sorry, Coffin J. And uh, I, my wife is is very lively. She's not cadaverous at all in my eyes. But that depends on what time it is. Yeah, that's true. You were in a dead sleep about 15 minutes ago. So <laughs> that was the whole reason I said that. I know that it's past your bedtime. So round of applause for Creepy Caitlin for staying up past her bedtime. And she's got like a full on almost toddler to deal with. Well, when are they considered a toddler? Like two, three years old? By the time they can walk. He's a toddler. They're a toddler. Uh, So I do appreciate you coming on. Uh, Anyway, before we jump into everything, I just want to get everybody like a really kind of quick bummer explanation about what's going on. It's been a whole month since we've dropped a podcast. Unfortunately, my lovely mother... um, we call her Mama Coffin. She actually had an Instagram account called Mama Coffin. Uh, she passed away, so I've just been kind of going through that. Um, you know, got hooked on the heroin, had to get off the heroin. Just kidding. Um, and then immediately after that, I got to go play script supervisor on Dylan's New Nightmare, which is a kind of fan film direct sequel to Wes Craven's New Nightmare. And the cool part is that it starred the original um, Nightmare alumni, uh, Miko Hughes, who played Dylan Porter in Wes Craven's New Nightmare. So got to hang out with him and also Nora Hewitt, the winner of uh, Face Off. So it was kind of a, it was a cool week and kind of a lot of mixed emotions and whatnot, but that's the reason for the absence. So thank you guys so much for hanging in there with us. Um, but we're back and we're not going to take any more breaks unless something happens. Knock on wood. Uh, that being said, I want to jump right into our creepy facts. I don't know. I, I, I think, Caitlin, because you're new to the podcast, I think you should go first. Oh, well, thanks. So my creepy fact is more so relevant to myself that I've learned now that I'm pregnant again. So we all know when a woman a pregnant is pregnant, <laughs> that her body changes. Well, the creepiest thing about that is her feet will also grow a whole shoe size with every single pregnancy. I always thought my mom had big feet, and now I know it's because of the six kids, you know what I mean? Yeah, none of my shoes fit already. And I've got five more months to go. So, okay, well, okay, after your first, okay, so let's let's track this. So prior to your first pregnancy, what was your shoe size? Oh God, I don't know if I want to put that out there. <laughs> these these facts are getting too creepy. <laughs> I know, K- Caitlin. I know that I, I'm not going to say that you have big feet, but I know that you know they're they're a good size. You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> but uh, okay, well, we don't have to get into particular sizes. I guess it's kind of like a rude question. How rude? You know, it's kind of like asking a woman's age. But I feel like you're young enough. I could ask your age, but I already know your age, so I don't give a fuck. Um, Just know that I'll take shoes for Christmas. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, you'll have to share your shoe size if you wanna. If you want a shoe, <laughs> um, <clears throat> you'll get. You'll you can text me privately. Uh, okay. Well, thank you for the creepy pregnancy fact. I'm sure you know what that'll be your thing every time you come on. I just want a new creepy pregnancy fact. Um, oh, there's lots. <laughs> oh, I bet Zachy Poo. I think it's your turn, buddy. Um, okay, so my creepy fact is obviously less fun um, and more, like, freaky. Um, but the Nobel Prize was recently given to a, a, a group of scientists who proved that the universe is not locally real. 
which essentially means that they took an atom and they split the radiation, the light that comes off of it. And if the universe was real, you would expect if the lights refracted two ways and you put the same filter on it and you move the filter in the same ways, they should always line up. Like they should be an exact mirror of each other. Um, and that's actually not what happens, which means that when things split, uh, when an atom splits and the radiation that it splits, it's not connected. Um, which means that you and everything you're made of and everything that everyone else is made of is not real at all. So, congratulations, you just found out you're not real. Well, I already knew that. So not a big fucking deal to me, <laughs> but, uh, gosh, okay. I was just making sure Caitlin was still awake. My goodness. This is you, Zach, when you get all in outer space and I'm like, huh? Um, yeah, it's so, so smart and so boring. I, yeah. well, give I don't think it's boring. I think it's interesting. And I think that it can certainly be, it's certainly creepy because I mean, I don't think anybody wants to perceive our reality as anything other than how we perceive it or to think that it could be any other way or or that it's all a lie. I mean, I knew my life was a lie. I've known that for years. Okay, well, I think we should move on from that. We're delving under the sea for my creepy fact today. Under the sea. Um, have you guys ever heard of Cymothoa exigua? No. A what? Cymothoa exigua. Oh, you know what? Now that you mention it, I've never heard of that. Okay, perfect. Thanks so much for <laughs> saying that. Uh, so, Cymothoa exigua, also known as the tongue-eating louse, is really a nightmare of a creature. Let me tell you about it. So, the tongue-eating louse is a widespread parasitic isopod that essentially severs and takes the place of a host fish's tongue. And I didn't even know that fish had tongues. Did you guys know that? Um pretty interesting uh, but I'm no expert on fish anatomy so uh, basically the parasite enters the fish through the gills works its way into the fish's oral cavity and uses its front claws to sever the blood vessels of the fish's tongue uh, the tongue necrosis from lack of blood uh, flow turns black falls off and then the parasite then replaces the fish's tongue by attaching its own body to the muscles of the tongue stub yes uh, once the parasite replaces the tongue, they feed on a steady diet of the host's blood and mucus. Mmm. And while it sounds awful, uh, it, it looks really fucking scary. Uh, the parasite does not actually do much harm to the host fish, and once the fish dies, uh, usually of natural causes, the parasite detaches from the stub and vacates the oral cavity, living to play another day. Creepy, right? And you, if you have a computer there, you should look up a picture, because it's disgusting. With that being said, I think it's time to move on from our creepy facts and maybe start chatting a little bit about the book, which is uh, Grady Hendrix's Horror Store. Yes. And we all read the book this time. So everybody has read the book. Caitlin, it's been a while since you read the book, right? Oh, June. I finished this book in three days. Three days reading this book because it was... Good. So wait, so that's a brag, like I finished this in three days, bitch. <laughs> that's a brag? Or is that like, it wasn't good, so it took me three days? Well, I listened to the audiobook, so that's kind of why I could finish it in three days. Did you like the audiobook? I found it intriguing. Okay. Yes. I, I haven't, I read this, like I physically read this. Zach, you listened to the audiobook too, didn't you? Yeah, I did. But we actually do have like a physical copy as well. So I kind of like cross-referenced once I got home. I read out, or I listened to it on a road trip, so. Oh, gotcha. Well, uh, without further ado, let us open the doors to a horror store. <laughs> Something strange is happening at the Orsk Furniture Superstore in Cleveland, Ohio. Every morning, employees arrive to find broken, jarring bookshelves, shattered glance water goblets, and smashed Lyripip wardrobes. Sales are down, security cameras reveal nothing, and store managers are panicking. To unravel the mystery, three employees volunteer to work a nine-hour dusk-till-dawn shift. In the dead of night, they patrol the empty showroom floor, investigate strange sights and sounds, and encounter horrors that defy the imagination. So now that we've all read the book, I guess what 
what you read this first, Caitlin. So what made you pick up this book and say, hmm, I want to read this? I was on a Grady Hendrix kick. I read The Final Girl Support Group, My Best Friend's Exorcism, Horror Store. And then I got about 100 pages into the Southern Book Club's Vampire whatever. And that's when I realized Grady Hendrix isn't for me. Oh, okay. Well, it took you four books to realize that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, he's... He's kind of interesting. I don't know how I feel about him yet. Um, but on the subject of Grady Hendrix, um, I do have a, a little bit about Grady Hendrix here. And we always want to chat a little bit about the author. Um, so Grady Hendrix is a novelist and screenwriter born in South Carolina, uh, but he's now based in New York City. He's the author of Horror Store, My Best Friend's Exorcism, Paperbacks from Hell, and We Sold Our Souls, all of which received critical praise from outlets including NPR, The Washington Post, The Wall Street Journal, Los Angeles Times, The AV Club, Pace, BuzzFeed, and more. Uh, He's also contributed to Playboy... The Village Voice and Variety. Uh, so, and you know what? For the life of me, could not find his birthday anywhere. So I don't know how old he is, but based on his picture, I would say he's probably like in his 40s. So he's a pretty young dude, and he's kind of blown up. I feel like in the last couple of years. Um, and you got? Do you guys watch? Did, I don't know if we talked about it. Did you watch my, my best friend's Exorcism movie? No, but it's on my to do. No, I have not. <sighs> Damn it! Because um, I I want it. I want to hear your thoughts on it, so we'll have to um, put that and come back to it. And uh, oh, ooh, ooh, and apparently there's going to be a horror story movie adaptation um, for which Grady Hendrix will also pen the screenplay. So and, uh, don't quote me on that, but I did read that today. Um, do you think this would make a good movie? I would watch it because in my mind, <laughs> I couldn't make it out. So it would be interesting to see on the screen. So, like, you had trouble envisioning some of the passages? Just like sometimes when he's talking about where we are in the store. Right. I just could not nail down the layout. Yeah, for all the cool graphics in the book, I feel like they could have used, like, a like a full-on store map or something. Mm-hmm. A uh, store map would have been excellent because it's funny. Be- I feel like Ikea is built for you to feel like you don't really know where you are in the store. Like, it's it's made to kind of push you through and you're kind of, like, moving, flowing through this thing. And if you stop at any moment and be like, where am I in relation to the front door? You'd have no freaking idea. And that's how I felt the entire book. So, Well, you know what, though? Maybe it's by design because we all know that this store they're poking fun at ikea and you guys have fucking been to ikea that place is so easy to get lost in yeah i could see it being intentional because that's exactly how i feel at ikea i'm like i really they're like hey we got to go back to the cabinets i'm like i don't even know how many areas ago that was you know well it's funny that you bring that up because one of the passages i reread was talking about exactly how it was set up to confuse people Oh, true. Okay, yeah. That's kind of... I can see it being totally intentional then, and he pulled that off well if that was intentional. Maybe we shouldn't be talking so much shit about Grady Hendrix. So, and, and the cool thing about this story is that there's... It's kind of a small cast of characters. There's only eight characters in the whole story. Um, nine, if you include, like, a paramedic, right? And people on the phone. But there's really only eight characters of any real substance. So it's, like, it's not a huge cast of characters. I feel like it's kind of... I'm not going to say it's a grounded book, but it's pretty, I don't know, it's pretty reeled in. You know, it's like a really quick pace. I don't feel like there's much of a, like a long story going on there. And yeah, the ending kind of, I, I don't know, ending kind of sucked, didn't suck at the same time, but we'll get to that. Um, so before we get started uh, on our best and worst characters, um, Caitlin, do you have a passage prepared that you've picked out that was like your favorite from the book? Oh, let me flip through. I do. Hold on. You should have had that already prepared, but sure. Oh! I'm just kidding. <laughs> Here we go. Amy felt something wrong with Ruth Ann's fingertips. They were hard like calluses, but the nails were all missing. And all the surrounding flesh was raw. In gouging at the holes, Ruth Ann's had worked her fingers to the bones, literally. Each digit in a bloody white tip. Amy, Ruth Ann screamed. Someone had her. She was being yanked backwards back into the pole. Amy grabbed her by the shoulders, but whatever was pulling inside was too strong. Hold on, Amy said. I don't want to see them, Ruth Ann gibbered. I won't let you go, Amy said. 
She braced her feet against the wall and leaned back, but Ruthann was slipping from her grip, sinking back into the hole, sinking into darkness. Ruthann, she yells. Her friend doesn't seem concerned at all. She was no longer resisting. She had stopped trying to fight back. Don't worry, Ruthann said. If I can't see them, they can't see me. Then without hesitation, she hooked her bony fingertips into her eye sockets and raked them down her face. He just has the greatest way <laughs> of pulling off things like that. Yeah, no, I, I remember that part because I read it yesterday and it was I was like, Ugh. and uh, you know what? I yeah. spoiler for Ruth Ann, but uh, I mean, Ruth Ann was a sweet, sweet lady. I don't think she deserved that. But uh, well, I'm sure we we'll, I'm, I know I'm sure that we'll talk a little bit more about Ruth Ann. But um, we have a little bit of a cold issue going on here, Jay. So <laughs> you can hear the sniffles and stuff, yeah. I'm sure. <clears throat> That's okay. Adds to the atmosphere. So is it just, why did you pick that? Was it because it was just so visceral? Ruth Ann was my favorite. We'll start out with that. <laughs> she was just the type of person that I felt like I would, would be. Oh, okay. Perfect. And I just felt so bad for her. So what you're saying is you want to get a job at Ikea? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm good. Oh, okay. Um, Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, I like I like Ruth Ann. I think Ruth Ann is like a close. She's not my favorite, but in terms of like uh, of the group of the group of people who uh, who do I want to hang out with most? Probably going to be Ruth Ann. She seems like a sweet lady. I've always gotten along better with older people anyway. I mean, you guys really being the exception. Um, so she just seems like a sweet lady that I would like come and talk to and joke with and maybe make sexual innuendos with, um, and then hope, you know, that I didn't get pressed with any sexual charges or sexual harassment charges. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so I like Ruth Ann and I was, I was sad. I was like, no. And yeah. And not only that, but I think she definitely had kind of like, uh, well, not that there was a lot of death in this, but she, she, she had probably like the worst, you know what I mean? Like it was kind of like, Oh fuck. Mm -hmm. Where does, where does Ruth Ann rank on your, your, in your scheme of things, Zach? There's eight characters. Eight characters being Amy, Basil, Ruth Ann, Trinity, Matt, Carl, uh, Warden, Worth, and then Pat, who just kind of pops in at the end. I mean, okay, so I'd probably put her top three characters because she just, yeah, seems kind of sweet and fun. And I think that, you know, this is where I feel like Grady Hendrix really excels is these pretty horrific death scenes. And I can verify that from other novels that I've gone through from him so he's really strong at this kind of stuff um i think ruth ann was w way one of his better characters like i struggle sometimes to like some of the characters he writes and this book was no exception to that but ruth ann uh was really nice and i love that trope because because i remember being a kid and when you were scared you would think if they can't see me you know if i can't see them they can't see me and you'd hide under your blanket <laughs> it's so funny to see that played out. Was that an uh, elephant? A <laughs> uh, little. <laughs> uh, it's so funny to see that played out in a more adult person in this like really horrific circumstance. Um, and it it was kind of the gut wrenching kill of the book. I feel like you're like, oh god, you know, <laughs> not Ruth Ann. <laughs> you should have taken someone else first. <laughs> should have been that bitch Trinity. Um, yeah, yeah, poor Ruth Ann. Poor Ruth Ann. Ruth Ann would be the one you go to when like you've like Trinity has run through you and she no longer thinks you're interesting. So you're just like, hey, Ruth. And she's like, I know it didn't work out with Trinity, but that's OK. <laughs> I know. And then she's like, but after this, I'm going to go home, call my grandchild and feed my birds. Come to grandma. I, or she'll bring you some soup or something. Merry Christmas. And you'd be like, oh, my God, you're the nicest. Thank you. I know. She's like, I heard you had the snuffles, so I made you eight pounds of chicken soup. Should last you a whole month. <laughs> oh, that sounds great. <laughs> oh, I do like chicken soup. Um, like, chi well, I don't know. I can have it without. I could go sus noodle. I don't know about you guys, but um, so and so that's your favy. Um, what about? Uh, okay, so we'll circle back around to Lee's favy, Zachy. What's what? Who's your number one in this? And I, 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 I think I know who it is. You told me earlier. Yeah, my my, I, I feel like it's one of Grady Hendrix's best characters, but the warden is just a great bad character. Like he's amazing, and actually, I'll just kind of jump right into my passage because it has to do with the warden. It was a voice of a preacher, a voice of the past, 
A voice for cathedrals. A voice from a time before microphones. It was a voice that denounced witches and flogged sinners. It was a voice that sang Latin while women burned at the stake and men were crushed beneath stones. And I feel like everything that the metaphor of the warden stands for, like that very uh, Protestant like work ethic, you work and you suffer and that's all you can do to actually fix yourself and be any good. Yeah, and you're totally not still. Um, I love that. That's kind of a bygone time. Um, I thought they brought him in in a really interesting way too, although I, it was a little silly. I, you know, they're like, hey, let's do a seance while the guy waits outside for the cops. I'm like, OK, <laughs> you know, but once the warden's there, I was like, he's a great character. Absolutely. I think it's one of the reasons he's my favorite, because I grew up in Baptist churches. So like this, like fire and brimstone, like suffering, like message is something that just like resonates in the youngest <laughs> of my imagination. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he kind of reminds me of like, I don't know, like a Baptist preacher. You get those vibes? Dude, I still will never forget the time that we went to that Baptist church. And remember, your Baptist church was like under construction or some shit. So they were literally renting out a Jewish synagogue to like hold mass in. And uh, <coughs> at some point, like within the synagogue, they're, they're, they're doing the, yeah, their hell and brimstone type of uh, sermon. And they literally said like, and the Jews shall burn. Hey. Like, literally, in the Jewish synagogue, I'm like, these fuckers are doing you a favor. You know what I mean? I'm sure they're charging you a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do remember your face when we left, and you were like, that was pretty That was pretty crazy. <laughs> I'm like, I'm pretty sure that's anti-Semitism. <laughs> but anyway, um, <clears throat> and, but when I, and when, I think of, uh, when I think of Warden Josiah Wirth, I, I don't know, like, his voice in my head um zach you've seen that movie without a paddle haven't you uh it's been a long time i don't remember it well but i think i know exactly what you're talking about i know you're not gonna know what the fuck i'm talking about but either way like i want to give i mean don't you want to give him kind of like a little bit of a country you know what i mean oh yeah that's what he had in my head okay okay cool me too me too yeah yeah, so, okay, well, that's... He's got that deep southern passion, too, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. where it's just, he's going for it emotionally. He's like, God, I'm going to fix your mental illness with suffering. You know, <laughs> like, damn. You know who could play that part? I guess so. Can I have a peach afterwards? Like, yeah, what's going on? <laughs> this is not Georgia. This is Ohio. Oh! Uh, but, um, you know, you know who could play him? That guy who played that fucking asshole in Avatar? Oh, that'd be a really good one. Yeah, yeah, he could play that guy. I imagine uh, there was that Waco movie, uh, the guy who played the preacher in that. Like, if he was much older, I feel like he'd be a great warden, too. Although it's a little bit of a different accent. Right, right. I don't know, but I did imagine him with a country accent, so I'm glad we're on the same page there. Yeah, kind of like Southern Revival kind of preacher, but he's not a preacher, you know. He's kind of, I don't know. Hey! Uh, there you go. He's a warden. Um... Okay, so my favorite character is Caitlin. Do you know who my favorite character is? I want you to guess because it's no fun unless somebody guesses. Um, I'm gonna have to say it's. Is it Basil? It is Basil. Did you tell her, Zach? <laughs> no, of course. I want you to be honest. If with you're me just right predictable. <laughs> I don't. I I promise. I don't tell my wife everything. <laughs> <It's> just... <laughs> I I don't believe you. Um, okay, well, yeah, Basil is my favorite. And for some reason, whenever I'm reading Basil, um, and I told Zach this, Caitlin, you might appreciate this. I imagined him as Mr. Mosby from The Sweet Life of Zach and Cody. I know everything. That is definitely not who I imagined, uh, but wow. <laughs> I, I, don't, I, don't know, I don't know why, but I just want him to be that guy. I don't know why. That's how he pictured it. So because I always liked Mr. Mosby, he just made me laugh. I don't know. I just have that guy in my head, so I like him. <laughs> Maybe I would have liked him more if that's who I had imagined, too. Who did you imagine? Like, how did you see him? Just this gangly white guy with the glasses. Oh. And, you know, all done up in his white shirt and tie. Just corporate. We know who has the more diverse head casting, <laughs> and that's me. <laughs> Just saying. Um, <clears throat> but pr I, I guess the reason why I like Basil is because, A, I feel like if he was my actual manager, I would, A really be annoyed by him because he's like a manager to a fault like he's really by the book you know what i mean but b i feel like it's it's a weakness in his character but it's like it's also a strength because 
uh, one one thing that it wasn't it was quoted in like one of his reports, like his reports uh, in the audiobooks. Does it like go over the reports and stuff in the book that it has? Yes. Oh, OK, OK, because like in one of the um, like in one of the books, like his managerial notes on Amy, he says um, and Amy, uh, just to kind of give a very, very brief su- summary on Amy, she's a 25 year old, like unhappy chick working at Orsk at what she considers to be a dead end job like uh Basil wants to like promote her, but she's not really taking the initiative. Um, and in his managerial notes, he says the function of a leader is to create more leaders, not followers. And I feel like that really sums up his character. Um, like he really takes the responsibility that he has as shop manager or whatever. Um, and I, I don't know. I just like him. Um, I don't know. Where does Basil rank on y'all's list? It sounds like you don't like him very much, Caitlin. And if that's the case, f- you. I'm just kidding. Well, there wasn't many characters that I really did like, but there weren't really many characters that I just didn't like. They were just all kind of meh. Um, I'd say with with Basil, I feel like that he did something interesting. You know, it is it is kind of the whole book is kind of a commentary on like working and especially working for a company like IKEA and this like productivity mindset. And Basil True. is as far as i can remember the only character who's like he's taking care of someone else so he has a reason to like really just kind of see this out and do a good job ruth ann is like a little bit you know she's like older but just kind of working because that's what people do amy's like totally discontent trinity's like this almost internet personality that's just into the stuff she's interested in and uh who was the male's name that was with trinity matt Matt. Matt is like, you know what I mean? He's kind of living to try to bang Trinity. And Carl, the homeless guy, is the homeless guy that <laughs> sleeps in a store. So. Right. <laughs> Carl's just a homeless um, guy. If there's a homeless guy named Carl who listens to it, he's going to be like, hey, that's, I, I take issue with that. But right. um, yeah. Yeah. Ba- Basil's just a good guy. And not only that, but he's got a little sister. And I guess her birthday's like the day after the events of the book. Um, and, you know, like whenever he's on the edge and not doing so well. That's the thing that he clings on to. So I don't know. He was just a, he, I was a little endeared to Basil, um, especially at the end. You know what I mean? At the end, like before the prologue or the epilogue, he kind of, you're kind of like, really Basil, you're going to do her like that. Fuck you, bro. And then at the end, they kind of team up and they're like, nah, bitch, we're going after these fuckers together. Um, so it's pretty cool. Uh, so segueing into that, you said that you didn't really have anybody that you didn't really like, but who would you say was your least favorite character? Caitlin. Uh, that's a really tough question. I I found the main character Amy just kind of grating. But other than that, like I said, I can't really remember much about her. Well, that's the but problem. She just didn't. I didn't find her endearing at all. Yeah, well, I felt like she was too flip floppy. She kind of switched from emotion to emotion. I can never get like a handle or a grip on exactly like what her mindset or like thought process was so she was a pretty weak protagonist to me um i didn't really care for her there were other people in the book that i would have preferred to focus on but uh that being said you know they're gonna make a movie out of this they could get a good actress and they could flesh this lady out you know what i mean but in terms of of uh, of the thought process uh as grady hendrix has it in the book it is a little disjointed i feel like you know yeah, I I think um, Amy Amy's an interesting character, but not a very good one. Not in a good way. That's OK. It's, it goes back to it being the commentary it is on working like this is what a lot of people are in the world, like these really dissatisfied people who are like, this fucking sucks. I come in here every day. I hate it. And pe- like even the other people who are like, listen, I come here because I support my sister and like, I'm just trying to do a good job. Can you do the, the same? And she just is totally unsatisfied. I will say, though, that her what she went through in the book is, I think, the best plot point. Uh, You know what I mean? Like it she was kind of cured by this, like the warden's treatment for her. And it's really horrible. (laughs) So It was kind of short lived, but he really did uh, do a number on her. Like, and I just feel like Amy is very, like you said, she's, she's dissatisfied, but she's also like content with her mediocrity. She's not striving towards anything. Like she has no 
personal goal. And so I don't know. I'm a, but at the same time, like you said, dude, that's like a reflection of our fucking society. Hello. I am fucking Amy. Just fucking call me Amy. Yeah. Yeah. Haven't we all been her? Yeah. I, I think that's why we all dislike her. You know what I mean? We're like, that bitch is being just like me. <laughs> I know, yeah. We just find just fault in her because it's the things we hate about ourselves. Um, yeah. And but, then uh, as to like the worst character, in my opinion, I really feel like Trinity and Mark was Matt. The, the things that were done with those characters and the way that they interact. Like I wanted to like Trinity, but like her actions are kind of stupid in the book. Um, and Mark, Matt, I, I mean, but it's all, it goes back to it being like regular people. Like these are real people that you meet sometimes. And I don't like these type of people. So I didn't like them in the book. Um, but I don't feel like I got anything satisfactory. Like I kind of wish what happened to Ruth Ann would have happened to them. And Ruth Ann could have just gotten her fingers chopped off or something. And I'd have been like, look, she's the sweet old lady survived, you know? <laughs> Yes, and but his name is Matt. I said that three times, but he didn't acknowledge me. Not Mark. Uh, but <clears throat> no, I'm not, sorry. Not, it should have been Mark. <laughs> it's, my, it's my fucking podcast. You're <laughs> fucking up the names. No, it's not that big of a deal. Um, just uh, just for lack of confusion. So, but you got to pick one. Who's dying in your book, Trinity or Matt? Pick one. Who, who do you want to die? Go ahead, Caitlin. I asked Zach. <laughs> Oh, okay. You asked me directly. Yeah. Um, I'm going to say, I think Trinity's the fun one to kill. You know what I mean? She's the silly, like, she's what really should be a final girl in some ways. No, she's a girl that dies. I think she's really. Sh- she's like the first kill in Scream. Good. Like, she's that girl. She's a girl who dies in the fucking opening. Yes, credits exactly. Um, what, is, uh, do you agree? You want, you're going to kill Trinity then? Caitlin? Yeah, I'm going along with that one. Uh, okay. You know what? Me too. Uh, yeah, Trinity is my least favorite character. I just found her to be way too hyper-focused on this paranormal crap. Um, she seems a little entitled. And then, frankly, <laughs> did, any, did anybody else get the impression that, like, she's way more into Matt than Matt is into her? You know what I mean? Like, she's just like, where's Matt? And he's just like, it's not a fucking ghost, Trinity. Get your head out of your ass. Um, anyway, she's just not someone that I could see myself really enjoying being around. I mean, she's got like no respect for authority. Like she's okay sneaking in after hours to conduct some bullshit thing. And then not only that, but she's going to be all about this ghost crap. But two things. A, she has a shit fucking name for a ghost show. Ghost bomb. That's a fucking terrible name. I think it's supposed to be like, like photo bomb, you know, but with ghosts, I think it's awful. Uh, and then she's not only that, to be relevant and hip. Yeah, she really is. And exactly. She's just like, this gets views. Uh, and then on top of that, she's like, you know, she's just like, he, uh, Basil is outside. Let's conduct a seance. And then during that, she's like, I don't even know what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, that's, I, I thought the seance was handled very goofy and Trinity's kind of like the lead charge of that. I mean, honestly, I wish the warden would have come through Trinity's Trinity. body. Yeah, I think it was that well, poor homeless man. Well, I was, you <laughs> yeah, know what? I what was, did he do, man? I know. He was just like, I was just trying to stay warm. Um, but you, <laughs> you know what I, I didn't understand? Maybe I could get your interpretation if you remember. So there's a point during the seance where like Trinity is like fucking having nasty fucking snot bubbles and shit coming out. You know what I mean? And then it like comes out of her mouth and it's like ectoplasm floats out of her mouth and then goes into Carl. So I'm like, so was the warden in Trinity before? I'm not getting that. I feel like it was because she was the one in charge of the seance. It was using her energy to manifest. Gotcha. Okay. I could see that. I just, could you see like where I'd be confused though? I'm like, I don't get it, but that makes sense. Um, It was jumbly too. And what really should have happened is that the ectoplasm should have come from somewhere unknown in the store. I mean, that's really what should have happened. It was a little from the middle of the circle. Yes. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Yeah. No, I I agree. And so um, I guess Zach, what is your, um, so, okay. So let's switch over now uh, into um, kind of best and worst plot points. Uh, Zach, do you want to go ahead and, and start out with what's your favorite plot point? Um, is it what you mentioned about the rev or the, the reverend, um, the warden? Yeah, the wardens, uh, he has a treatment and, and kind of the wardens thing is he's promising to treat all these people's ailments through suffering. And he has like a special treatment for Amy and you really get to go along with Amy. Like some, some characters get tortured in ways that you don't get to see the whole time. Um, you just kind of come in on them, but Amy's treatment, you know, uh, 
I'll just give it away. She's strapped into a chair so tight that she's like extremely short of breath. She feels like she's going to die. She's just totally suffering. And she just gets, it's like she pushes past this wall of suffering and realizes that like, yeah, like it's true. I've been lied to about what I can be and I'm angry about it and it's not fair but like suffering is better than nothing, you know, suffering. Yeah. It's better to suffer the whole time than to, than to just let out and die. Um, and he, it kind of changes her character arc because of what she goes through. And there's a, even a little bit of a tinge of like, she kind of liked it. And a couple times in the book, she's like, eh, maybe I can go back to the chair, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. I thought that was the best plot point. I think the warden was used really well there. Um, you get a really good vibe for these like penitents as they're called, which are all the warden subjects that he's tortured and maimed over the, you know, God knows how long. Um, and yeah, I thought that was a very good, it reminded me of, uh, what is that movie? A clockwork orange Oh, where they strap him to the chair and they hold his eyes open. He yeah. just has to like watch all this crazy shit. Hey, Malcolm McDowell fucked up his eye during that scene. Um, You know what? What was that? I said Malcolm McDowell fucked his eye up during that scene. Um, But here, okay, while we're we're on that subject, I'm going to go ahead and read my passage just because it's very relevant to what you're talking about. So uh, my favorite quote is from Josiah Wirth um, from chapter 10. This is when he has Amy in his little torture chair. um, And I'm going to somewhat truncate it just to make sure I include the juicy bits. Um, So he goes... This is what you always needed. You have no secrets from me. Amy tried to struggle but was unable to move. I understand your madness. He whispered into her ear. Amy could hear the air wheezing in and out of the flap of torn skin across his throat. Your spirit is agitated and restless, and you engage in pointless activity roaming about in an excitable frenzy to no great effect. My tranquilizing chair allows you to stop fighting your nature. It masters your flesh. You will sit in contemplation here as your hot blood seizes its fever of circulation, and your brain, deprived of its poison, will at last achieve the steel you crave. It is humane and merciful, a freedom from your torments, and if you die, Isn't the stillness of death preferable to the vain agitation and senseless chaos of your life? It will be a great peace for you, Amy. A great peace. You weren't kidding, man. The warden's got some great... Powerful stuff. Yeah, he's got the best lines in the whole movie. Or whole movie. Whole book. <laughs> I mean, when I think of the film adaptation, the warden makes or breaks it. You know what I mean? Because even if Amy is a hateable character, you'll get to see that hateable character suffer. And if she's a good character, you know what I mean? You'll still get to you'll get, still get a message that I think is like the warden's whole thing will come out through her suffering. And a good actress will make it and a bad actress. You'll just be happy to watch <laughs> suffer, I guess. Who would you cast as? Let's do a quick exercise. Who you cast as Amy? In a movie. Probably Amber Heard. My dog stepped on a bee. <laughs> oh, oh gross. Well, well, first of all, no one's going to go see that movie. <laughs> no. <laughs> I know. Um, well, I mean, can't we? Don't we all want to see her strapped into a chair and tortured? <laughs> like, come on. Um, no, but in all seriousness, I would say. Um, God, who would be good for her? Who is just that really unhappy? Uh, what's her name from Twilight? Oh, Kristen Stewart. Kristen Stewart. Why Actually. is that the first one that came to my mind? I'm like, ugh, no. Because she just would be so great as that, like unhappy. Like I come here every day and it's torture. You know what I mean? Wrong. <laughs> right. Not only that, there's going to be so many. Ma- who a coffin J? Who would oh. you? Uh, who would you cast in this role? For some reason, I don't know if it's just because I think she's really hot, but I just want to see more Anya Taylor Joy and everything. Anya Taylor Joy would make a, I think would make a good Trinity, maybe. Nah, I don't know. I don't she, know. I feel like I've, she seems more sophisticated than Trinity. Yeah, but she doesn't seem like an Amy. I, well, I know. I, I that's why I was hesitant. But I mean, yeah, Kristen Stewart actually seems like a good casting, but. I feel like Amy's a blonde, don't you guys? 
I mean, not that she couldn't be a blonde, but I'm just feeling like she's a blonde. No, I saw Amy's a Amy's a brunette. brunette. Yeah. hundred <laughs> percent. Did it actually say Blondes that in the are, book? You know, never that mind, was never Trinity. Mind. Trinity was blonde. Oh, yeah. Oh, fuck. Okay, hold on. Let me think about this. You know what? I'm going to go with that chick from Twilight. <laughs> Glad I could come up with something original. <laughs> <Great>. Yeah. <laughs> You're both wrong. <laughs> uh, uh, oh. <laughs> Who do you? Who are you casting? I don't have one, but well, it's not sh- her. Well, then shut up. You don't have. Yeah. You don't have one. Then you, <laughs> yeah, that's then not you. even fair to comment. <laughs> yeah, it's because I dislike her that much. Uh. <laughs> oh, sorry. You know what? We're on favorite plot point. The way they tortured everyone. Very good. Wow. I loved when they put her in the closet and then the water and that i know and the penitents did that on their own they're so sick i know (laughs) what'd you guys think of like how they describe the appearance you're like people who are fucking dirty with no like smudged out faces don't 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 everybody speak at once (laughs) i don't remember that part (laughs) so i'm not very sure what you're here talking about i'm talking about the weird prisoners who sneak out of the fucking closets and shit they're fu- they're described they're like fucking dirty prisoner people with no faces. Oh. I don't remember them not having faces. I can assure you that Caitlin didn't realize that because Caitlin's <laughs> <laughs> had like kind of a long running uh, dream stop <laughs> thing with people with no faces. Um and it they're not prisoners unless they're, you know, sexual prisoners. So <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> You're welcome. Um and I thought they were they were kind of cool, and they like some of them were kind of like maimed too, if I remember correctly, right? Uh, I don't recall any of them being maimed, but I just remember them being fucking assholes. I thought they had like twisted limbs and stuff because they were people that were tortured in like similar ways. Oh, I, okay, I, yeah, no, I think you're right. I think you're right. And then the whole place was littered with rats. Um, yeah. So, okay, well, Caitlin likes the torture, which is interesting to me because when we're watching horror movies, anytime something bloody comes up, she's like, well, I'm going to go. Well, I thought that it was the best I'm written gonna go part. Ch- I'm going to go check the diaper. Right. No, I got gotcha. you. You like it in books, but not in movies. I got gotcha. you. That's fine. It's, you don't have to It's easier yourself. to read it than to like watch it because then when you watch it, it's too visceral. It's, yeah, it's too it's much. Like, oh, Jesus. Really? Because when I imagine that shit, it's probably it's always way worse than what the movie shows, unless you're talking about The Exorcist. Yeah, I'm that- probably not. <laughs> imagining it in that moment (laughs) i'm just reading it gotcha gotcha um and so i think my favorite plot point is i so okay so i think the setup of this story is fabulous right so it's like um i just love the idea that a it's the knockoff of ikea a place that everyone's familiar with so it's really easy as a reader to kind of put yourself in the space and kind of imagine the atmosphere because I buy all my shit there. It's fucking cheap. I hate building it, but I buy my shit there, right? Um, and and then I, right. I and I like stories that make, I guess, magic of the mundane. So you know, the next time I'm in IKEA, I'm gonna be like thinking about the story. Oh, this is kind of like the Bruca or whatever, you know. Um, I thought the employees were a little bit cookie cutter, like the 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 other characters, but I understood the plight of Amy. Um, you know, working somewhere that. You don't want to work where you don't really see having a future, but she's not like trying to get out really either. Um, I got a kick out of the whole like, I don't know, just just the idea of these people being trapped in the store overnight. I just think that that's cool. And then the thing that failed for me is the execution of the idea, you know, wasn't a hundred percent there for me. I thought I had some cool ideas that I just wasn't a hundred percent in love with the execution. I thought that some of the stuff, like, I thought the whole fucking, oh, I'm in a lazy river trapped inside a fucking cabinet. I just thought that was a little silly for me. Personally. I know you liked it, Caitlin. I'm, I like to bust your bubble a little bit. But I just thought it was a little goofy. It's just the one that comes to top of mind when I think of that. Yeah. And not only that, but just the whole setup, you know, with the vandalism and like, there is shit on this fucking stool. You know what I mean? Like, that's disgusting. Like, I... I, I f- I, <laughs> yeah, that was yeah. Cool. Just like that's nothing's worse than human poop. Um, 
And then in terms of, you know, we kind of went over everyone else's least favorite plot point. I just, for me, the ending, it was so bleh. Not necessarily the epilogue, but like the last couple chapters, to be exact, was really cheesy. And then the resolution, um, <laughs> when Amy gets up there and gives her fucking Braveheart speech to all the fucking zombie dudes. You know what I mean? She's like, <laughs> um, A, I thought that was really cheesy. Um, and then B, you know, it seems to work. And then they're like, fuck, they're turning on us still. Uh, so it just, it didn't really work. And it kind of a cliche idea of like the henchmen destroy, destroying the, you know, the big bad. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, I really feel like when the warden had died, they should have been freed or something. Yeah, yeah. But then there would be no sequel. No, I'm just kidding. It was just very cliche, very like 19 or uh, like Nightmare on Elm Street 4 when all the fucking souls come popping out of Freddy's body and rip them apart. Um, that's what I was envisioning when I read that. I'm sure that's a reference that either you were going to get right off the bat. But that being said, I, I like the team up that you're left with, though. Like, I felt like there's more adventures to be had inside this new planet baby store that is now in place of where Orsk was. And I just like the team up of Basil and Amy at the end. I'm just like, this is, these are our fucking ghostbusters. And I think they're going to kill it. Fucking Mr. Mosby and Kristen I, uh, Stewart. I've got to disagree with that. Uh, yeah. Completely. Yeah, I, I feel oh, like you guys, you know, in fact, I feel like, okay, I don't think they, I don't think they did the warden thing. Great. But I don't think it was that bad. You know, I, I could have seen better endings, but okay. You know, you got rid of the bad that way. The things that I think were not executed well were why, you know, what is like the beehive? Because, right. you know, is it just a torture place no, and these are the no, bees no, no. or these like workers no. and they just do the work of this warden? Yeah. So think th think about it. Like th think of them it? more as like worker bees. Right. And then like the prison slash orsk is like the beehive. So that's why they call it the beehive. It's like, you know, so they're all like little worker bees. They're kind of mindless. and uh, The warden's the queen, you know. <laughs> Which is kind of funny because he's supposed to be like a manly man, but really he's just the queen bee. Get it, queen. <laughs> and I feel like the team up at the end, I felt like was the worst part. And I'm just going to spoil the ending. So they essentially, Amy and Basil make it out. They're offered by corporate to like, hey, if you guys keep your mouth shut, it's like we'll get you really cushy jobs that pay well. Amy refuses. Basil apparently takes it. Um, or no, he doesn't take it. You're right. He um, works at McDonald's. We find out until he, the very right, end. The but very we find end. out he worked at McDonald's. And they both end up working at the store that's built in the ashes. Baby Planet. And what's going on is they think that... Uh, God dang it. Was it Mark? Matt. God, why can't I? Matt. I hate these names. Um... I hate Mark and Matt. They need to be the same thing. Anyway, so Matt is... They believe Matt and Trinity to still be alive somewhere in the beehive. And they're going in to save them. But the whole Lazy River thing destroys that. Because, like, the penitents still try to kill them. Even with no warden. So why would they be going back to try to... Like, thinking they're alive. They almost died themselves just trying to get out. Uh, I didn't think that was played out well. Well, not only that, but I'm like... It was a really short book. They should have just fucking gone back in and got him. You know what I mean? Let's just like it was kind of short lived. They should have extended that. We could have seen it. But I, I like I like the very ending mostly because Basil was my favorite character. So I was all on top of I'm like, my boy Basil. Yes, son. But uh, um, but I will say, uh, uh, creepy readers, if you're going to read this book, read the actual physical copy because the physical copy is, I think, why this book actually works. Um, it, you know, it's got these fun diagrams. It's got, um, like write-ups about the employees that these little pages and it's got other, the wardens, uh, the subject matter for like some of the patients that he's treated. And it's, if you see it as like a magazine or like an Ikea, like, you know, buy these products, right. it makes a lot more sense why this book was made. Yeah, um, it's the book itself it is a little bit of a novelty. The audiobook was done well. I'm not gonna crap on anyone for that. It was done really well, but it's just not a great like audiobook experience compared to the i this IKEA looking book because it looks like you could shop for these things, mm -hmm. and I love that. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Putting the uh, 
putting the novel and novelty horror stories, huh? Uh, but yeah, anyway, so let's go ahead and we're already like an hour into this baby. So let's go ahead and give our final ratings. Uh, and I'm, and on our rating system, it's always at a five. Caitlin, you've listened, so you should know this. But uh, I'm saying that our rating system should be out of five brukas. And brukas are small yellow couches, uh, one of which is featured on the cover of Horror Store. It sells for two ninety nine. dollars It's kind of cute uh, and rather economical. I'm not sure how sturdy it is or how long it would last. Uh, but Caitlin, you're the newbie. Let's start with you. Uh, out of how many five brukas would you give Horror Store by Grady Hendrix? I would give it a 3.8. And it's getting that extra bump just because of the novelty of the book. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, if you had to base it solely on just the audiobook, what would you give it? Probably, let's say, a 2.9. Okay. Pretty generous still. Pretty generous. What about you, Zach, out of how many brukas? I'm going to do the same thing. I feel like it's a 2.7, like just overall execution story-wise. If it wasn't in this cool little booklet form, um, I give it a 2.7. I'd bump it up to like a three and a half if you if you actually get the the book. Okay, gotcha. Well, you guys are very generous. I'm feeling like the the Grinch or fucking Mr. Scrooge in this one because I put in a horror store at a 2.3 out of five, um, and that's based on the book itself. Knowing that it is a little bit of a novelty, um, I did like seeing like all the different furnitures because I. I I, sometimes I like to not have to imagine everything, you know? Um, and I do like that it's kind of like a catalog. That's pretty cool. Uh, but at the same time, it kind of annoys me because of the way it's shaped. It doesn't fit nicely with any of the other books on my shelf. So that's a little bit annoying, if I'm being honest. Yes. <laughs> uh, and that's just from somebody who likes to keep a nice library. Like, p- there's many people out there who will understand my plight. Um, so that's my biggest complaint is the shape of the book. Um in terms of the book, I I am finding Grady Hendrix to be very readable, like because he's a quick read, you know, and I enjoy the stories enough that I keep reading. But there's nothing at the end of the day that makes me go like, ah, oh, I'm going to reread this book 50 times. And I like to reread books. So for me, I'm kind of like. Well, how many Grady Hendrix books have you read? Um, I have read Horror Store, My Best Friend's Exorcism. I read. Uh final girl support group and those are the only three i've read so we've read all the same books yeah coming up next episode we will be sifting through the spider web of terror uh written by james murray aka murr from impractical jokers and darren wearmouth uh i'm two chapters in to this baby and i can tell you already that it's a nasty nasty piece of work so if you suffer from arachnophobia uh next ep- next week's episode is sure to be a scream until then you know i just want to say thanks so much to creepy caitlin for joining us uh for the first time on the pod hopefully one of many times i hope you come back you'll come back right we'll find another book i it was fun thank you for having me coffin jay yeah yeah you know what we'll 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 have you come back when me when i finally read court of thorns and roses maybe that'll be a private discussion between you and i christmas present ever oh okay well you know i already have that book and and it doesn't cost me any money so deal um, yeah, I bought it for you last Christmas. I, I know you did. And I, I did say in my first episode that I would read it before Christmas. So I will tackle that after the next episode, okay? Um, and then I'll have, oh, you, I can't wait. I'll have you back and we can chat about it. Um, Zach, you can fuck off for that Fantastic. one because you weren't even supposed to be on this one. But you still joined because we love you. Um, and Zach, of course, after I insult you, I just want to say thanks for coming on again. I can always depend on you to be a good time. And I'm not just talking about on the podcast, ladies. Thanks for making it awkward. I, I'm confessing my love to you, Coffin J. Honey, I love you. It was a really fun experience. And uh, of course, creepy readers, keep it creepy out there. Hey, are you guys going to go f- right now? No, I'm going to bed. Oh. I have to be up at seven <laughs> with a toddler. Oh, well, you could get better sleep if you did. Just saying. But uh, anyway, until why don't ne- you come down here and do it for me? <laughs> oh, babe, I'm all I'm over that shit. I'm just going to hit the headboard by myself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my God. Has, has your dad ever, has your dad ever like caught you guys or heard you guys or anything like that? 
Her dad's so deaf, it's unbelievable. Oh, that's Andy's kind of a nice sound machine. Oh, gotcha. Well, that's pretty good. You better convenient. not listen to this podcast. <laughs> I, I need a sound machine, but my sound machine would just be sounds of other people having sex. Maybe you guys could record something for me sometime. Uh, anyway, <laughs> until next time, keep reading, creepers. Ha, ha, ha.